escorting the queen, or the third meal being the meal of the Holy One. So all of this combined together becomes very interesting because what we, what we see here is like a little bit of a picture of what we're going to have happen when we attend the marriage supper of the Lamb. Let me give you an example. You have, uh, you have six days in which to work, and on the seventh day you rest. You know, you have a period between the birth of Christ, or some would date it to the crucifixion of Christ, and some would date it to the beginning of the church on Pentecost. But at some point in that time, throughout modern history, you're going to have a 2,000-year time frame. And then the Bible says in two days God will revive us, but in third day, on the third day He raises us up. And so the picture is after about 2,000 years, the Messiah is going to return. And by the way, the Essenes believe that. Uh, there were Jewish rabbis that have taught that for centuries, 2,000 years, 2,000 years, and 2,000 years. And the, the time would be divided up in, in three 2,000-year periods. So you work for six days, and then on the seventh day you rest. So that's a picture of 6,000 years, and then we go into the millennial reign of Christ. However, watch this. Don't miss it. When the sun sets on the sixth day is when the Sabbath begins and when the meal begins. And then you go into the meal, and then the next day after the Sabbath ends, you come to the conclusion of the seventh day, which is the day of rest. Then you go back to your work day. So in other words, at the end of the seven-year tribulation, are you hearing me? One year goes by, two years, three, four, five. We're standing before God the first couple of years. We're getting our rewards in Revelation 11. But when you get to the end of the book of Revelation, which is the conclusion of six years of heaven, you finally come to the seventh year in heaven to the marriage supper of the Lamb. See, it's parallel to working six days on earth, resting on the seventh day. The seventh year in heaven, when the church is in heaven during the seven-year tribulation, the seventh year in heaven will be the time of the meal. Someone said, well, that sounds real good. Where'd you find that in the Bible? Everything is by pattern. Everything is by um, a type or shadow. And when you read the Bible, it tells you that when a man and woman get married, now y'all gonna love this. I mean, if you haven't got married yet, go tell your pastor this one. If you're about to get married, in the Old Testament time, a husband and wife, when they were married, first of all, he was not permitted to go immediately into war. They took one year off. And, be, and that, so what I'm saying is that when you look at the picture here, you have the last seven years, or the, last, the seventh year in heaven, seven-year tribulation on earth, seventh year in heaven, where are we going to be? We're going to be the seventh year celebrate. Can you imagine a supper that lasts a year long? Hello, somebody. Someone asked me one time, am I going to be fat in heaven? I said, I don't know. Don't ask me. Get a revelation from God and see how much weight you're going. You know, when, <laughs> I had a lady ask me one time. It was the funniest thing. She says, when the coming of the Lord takes place, do you think I'm going to shed all these pounds? I said, honey, I don't know, but I know one thing. I don't think that manna has any fat grams in it. I think we can eat as, I think we can eat as much heavenly manna as we want to eat and not have to worry about it. But, uh, you know, we're going to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb, and there's no doubt that there'll be the fruit of the vine. There'll be the bread there because that's all a part of a Jewish wedding supper anyway. But I hope you can understand, I hope you can see the parallels of what I'm talking about here. The, the parallels of how these particular meals through history fit in to what the picture is of the marriage supper of the land. Now, let me go back to the Didache for a moment because it was a document, and as I said earlier, it was found in 1873, translated 10 years later in the year uh, 1883, and was a document which was known in the early church, and uh, what, it goes back to about 120 B, uh, I'm sorry, 120 AD, or about 120 years after the birth of Jesus. Now, I'm going to give you some quotes from it. It deals with Christian behavior. It deals with practical Christian behavior. It also deals with the future, but it talks about the communion meal. Now, let me read to you three passages from the Didache that tell you about the, about the communion meal. We would call it the Lord's Supper. Here's what it says in section 14, verses 1 and 2. On the Lord's own day, gather together and break bread and give thanks, having first confessed your sins so that your sacrifices may be pure. But let no one who has a quarrel with the companion join until they have been reconciled. That's what Paul taught in Corinthians when he talked about don't receive the Lord's Supper unworthily. We are to judge ourselves. We're to go to our brother if we stand praying and have an ought against him. We're to go to our brother and forgive each other before we even pray or give our gifts. So that's very interesting. That totally agrees with the revelation of the Apostle Paul. Notice in the Didache in, ch in uh, chapter 9, verse 
verse 2, these are prayers that are supposed to be offered during a communal, communion meal. Quote, we give thanks, our Father, for the holy wine of David, your servant, which you have made known to us through Jesus, your servant. To you be glory forever. And then in chapter 9, verses 3 and 4, this is a quote as well. We give thanks, our Father, for the life and knowledge which you have made known to us through Jesus, your servant. To you be glory forever. Just as this broken bread is scattered upon the mountains and then was gathered together and became one, so may your church be gathered together from the ends of, of the earth into your kingdom. For yours is the glory and the power through Jesus Christ forever. Now, according to the Didache, there was a third prayer that was prayed at the conclusion of the meal. Now, these are three different prayers here. Here's the third one. Quote, to us, you have graciously given spiritual food and drink and eternal life through your servant. Gather your church from the four winds into your kingdom, which you have prepared for it. For yours is the power and the glory forever. May, may, uh, may, may grace come. May this world pass away. Hosanna to the God of David. If anyone is holy, come. If anyone is not, let him repent. Then it ends by saying, Maranatha, Amen. Maranatha, amen. Now, it's interesting that in, the, in reading these three prayers that are found in this early Christian document that dates back to the year 120, 120 years after the birth of Christ, it mentions two things. Number one, it mentions a couple times your servant David. Why does it mention your servant David? Because if you look at the, the particular prayers, the conclusion with David has to do with the fact that the kingdom was promised to David. Remember that David was the king of Israel, but he was promised an eternal seat in the millennium of the Messiah. So these are prayers concerning the kingdom of God coming to the earth and the future of the kingdom of God through the Messiah, which is Jesus Christ. Now, a second thing about these prayers that I want to point out is the word Maranatha. Maranatha is an Aramaic word. It's not really a Greek word or a Hebrew word. It's an Aramaic word. Now, Paul uses that word in, in his writings as it relates to uh, the, the communion, as it relates to the supper of the Lord and things of this nature and communion with God. And he says, Maranatha. Now, Maranatha uh, is a code word in Aramaic. Now, people want to know, they say, where did that word come from and what was it about? What I had studied and found out a couple years back that I thought was extremely fascinating is this, that there were a lot of Christians in the Roman Empire, but especially when the persecutions began to break out, they necessarily uh, didn't know who was really a Christian and who was real. So it's believed that someone coined an Aramaic, not a Hebrew term, not a Greek term, uh, but an Aramaic term, Maranatha, which means he comes or the Lord comes. And what they would do, let's say I'm walking along and I see someone, but I'm not sure if they're really a believer, and I would say Maranatha. And if they would look at me and they'd say, excuse me, what did you say? You would know they weren't a Christian. But if you looked at that person and said Maranatha, they'd say, ha, Maranatha, he comes. Then you would know you had actually met a believer. So the, the, the particular third prayer ends with the word Maranatha, meaning the Lord comes. Now let me give you the verse, because I've mentioned here about the marriage supper of the Lamb. The Bible tells us, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. To her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he said to me, Right, blessed are they that are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. Now there in Revelation 19 is the story of the marriage supper of the Lamb. Then Paul tells us, In whom you trusted, after that also you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom after you believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the pur purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. Now notice in Paul's writings, he uses the word, the earnest of our inheritance. That Greek word is a word that's used three times, and it's talking about the Holy Spirit, but it's a word meaning to purchase something, to put down payment money. In fact, the ancient Greeks used that word for what we would call today an engagement ring. So watch this, the Holy Spirit is our comforter, but he is our engagement ring to show us that we have a future inheritance. Just like a woman wears an engagement ring, and when a single young man looks at her, he knows, wait a minute, I can't ask her out because she's already spoken for. The Holy Spirit is our engagement ring that says Jesus is alive, he is coming, and you are going to be with him one day if you will remain faithful to him. Speaking of that, of going to be with him one day, several years ago there was a missionary that... Um, 
he worked for for 40 years on the mission field and his wife actually died there they had several children there and so he was getting up there in years and he came back to the united states after 40 years of being on the mission field and as they were getting ready to get off the boat in new york there was a movie star on and they asked everybody else to stay on the boat till the famous 